Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is February 15th, 2024. This is part two of the series I've begun on the son of perdition. And I am going to now begin to talk about what will shortly come to pass concerning all of the people in this world who are living in the very real reality of having the son of perdition in their heart. I'm going to be reading from uh, notes that I have made rather than uh, just talking extemporaneously because I want to be very clear with everything that I say in this and the coming videos because the time is near and I want to be very particular with respect to going to the scripture and uh, bringing light to the prophetic word so that everyone, including those who do not believe in Jesus, can begin to understand what is about to transpire. Um, this is it. The son of perdition. Uh, Judas is a type of the son of perdition. A type means that it is, he's a parable. He is a prophetic person who portrays a prophetic reality. The prophetic reality that Judas portrays is the mystery of iniquity or the mystery of sin, the mystery of the carnal man, the mystery of the carnal nature that we all have inherited from uh, Adam. And God gave us the challenge of conquering that carnal nature here in this world. It's a very uh, important story hidden in many, many mysteries. I'm going to put a link to uh, Prophet Ken Vischer's uh, webpage where he has several series of writings that are foundational to understanding exactly what the purpose of God is uh, in history throughout, throughout the ages. God has, what God has done is he has planned all of history in advance and he hid mysteries before the foundation of time. So these mysteries have never been understood by the powers, by the principalities, by the rulers of the present age, including, of course, all the demonic rulers and any of the uh, human beings who have followed the demonic rulers in their quest to become uh, great in this world. Now I need to define a few terms that the uh, Bible uses a lot with respect to the ideas I'll be talking about. I'm talking about the mystery of iniquity. The word iniquity means sin. Sin is defined as missing the mark of God's perfect law. And so sin is considered to be uh, lawlessness. When you walk in sin, you are walking in lawlessness. You are walking contrary to God's law. The, you know, that's one of the great heresies of the church and, of course, all the New Age teachers because um, if you obey God's law, they call you legalistic. And uh, most of the church is lawless now. Most New Age uh, teachers are lawless. They think they can do whatever they want uh, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. Um, but that's not the definition of God's law. <clears throat> Ultimately, those words, iniquity, sin, lawlessness, means that you indulge in your own self-will. What you decide, what you determine to do, is lawful for you. That's what the mystery of iniquity is that you end up defining your truth. You've heard that before. What's your truth? No, there is one truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one comes to the Father unless he comes through me. See, that is the heir. Jesus is the stumbling stone. That's why no one receives him and accepts him because they think that their way is better. They think they can get around uh, what he requires. And the Jews especially did that. And that's why they crucified him. Yes, they did. They were the ones who crucified him. Uh, repeatedly stated in the scriptures that the Jews delivered him over to death. They killed him because they didn't like what he said. And he told them that they could not receive what he said because they were of their father, the devil. Their father was Satan. Now there's a lot of uh, very perverted teaching going on these days by new Christians who talk about the Nephilim and <clears throat> others that they say are of their father, the devil. And they relegate them to a place of never having any potential or opportunity for salvation. Utterly false doctrine. Uh, I believe in the restoration of all things, the restitution of all things, the salvation of all souls. That is what the Bible teaches over and over and over and over and over. And I've studied that repeatedly now for 30 plus years. Not quite 30, it's been 27 years. <clears throat> we sin when we choose our will instead of God's will. But Jesus fully submitted his will to his Father's will. Jesus said he only did what he saw his Father doing. When he came to the point of having to go to the cross, he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. He didn't want to do that. Who wanted to go through crucifixion? But he finally said, not my will, but yours be done. That was why he became a man. That's why God impregnated Mary with his DNA, mixed his DNA with the DNA of Mary, and produced the perfect man, the Son of Man, who is also the Son of God, known as Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Anointed One. There is only one Anointed One. There are many false Christs now out there, many false prophets prophets out there, but there is only one Anointed One. The Anointed One is Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, the Son of of God, who was also a son of man, a son of a woman. Now, the mystery is this. God lets, God has let the mystery of iniquity work throughout the entire history of creation. Until now, iniquity rules the earth totally. You cannot go anywhere to get away from sin. You cannot go anywhere to get away from evil. Evil controls every aspect of our lives in every single way that you can consider. Now in 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 7 through 8. It says that God lets this mystery of iniquity work in all men until God himself takes this man of sin, this man of lawlessness, the son of perdition, out of the way. Takes him out of the way by utterly destroying him by the brightness of his coming. What I'm talking about today, and I will be talking about now for a while, is, is what is this brightness of his coming? The whole world, the whole church is deceived by this false doctrine called the rapture. Everyone who names the name of Christ thinks that they're going to be automatically raptured out of here before it gets too bad. Well, it's already too bad. How many people died from COVID? How many people were maimed for life from COVID? and what they did to us because of that planned epidemic. How many?
Now, there's a mystery that is in John chapter 17, verse 12, where Jesus says, and he's referring to his disciples, that he saved or he kept all of his disciples except he lost only one. Who did he lose? He lost the traitor. He lost Judas Iscariot. But then he, John refers back to that saying of Jesus in John 18, 9. And in 18, 9, it says that Jesus lost no one. How do you reconcile those two things? She, a lot of people will say that scriptures are contradictory and therefore you cannot believe them. No, they're not contradictory. The point is you have to learn the scripture line upon line, precept upon precept. You have to put together this scripture with this scripture so that you can begin to understand all the scriptures. So he lost one of his disciples, Judas, because after Judas realized that he had betrayed Jesus unto his death for money, 30 pieces of silver. Judas repented. He went and threw the money to the Pharisees who had paid him. And then he went out and hung himself. It says he repented of what he had done. He did repent. But he could not restore himself back to the possibility of ever becoming an overcomer. You see, the apostles and the prophets are the foundations of God's city, New Jerusalem. And Judas forfeit his ability to be a part of that foundation. An overcomer, an overcomer is one of the foundations of the city of God, of New Jerusalem. Judas forfeit his place. You see in Acts chapter 1 that the apostles had to find a replacement for Judas, and they did. They found Matthias, who had been with them from the beginning, from the time that, of uh, Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist. And it says, there's a scripture David wrote that says, let another take his place. And so Matthias was chosen to take Judas's place as one of the foundation stones of New Jerusalem. So Judas himself is a type of the son of perdition. He is not the son of perdition. He is not the carnal nature of man. He had the carnal nature of man like we all do. See, even now, even today, I still have the carnal nature that I have to fight against every day. If any, if any sin pops its head into my, uh, comes into my head to do, I have to immediately take that thought captive and I have to say, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, I don't do those things. I do only what I see my father doing. Would my father do that? Would his son do that? I'm not going to do that either. You know, that is the mark of an overcomer. You fight this carnal nature, this man of sin, this man of lawlessness, this son of perdition within us because it grows within us the whole time that we're growing in God as a new man. See, when we first believe in Jesus, we receive the earnest of the Holy Spirit. Our spirits then are born again, but only in seed form. And John chapter 1 verse 12 says, to those people who believed in Jesus, who received him and believed in his name, he, Jesus, gave the right for them, the right, this is your only right. You don't have rights in this world. The controllers, the rulers of this world, they determine your rights. And you, you try to fight for your rights, you find out what happens when they really want to take them away. You have one right, and that is the right to become a child of God, a son of God, if you believe, truly believe in Jesus. And when you truly believe in Jesus, then you will walk in what's called the obedience of faith, according to Romans chapter 1, 5. 
See, faith is truly believing in Jesus. And when you truly believe, then you will obey what Jesus says. If you don't obey, you don't really believe. The saying, to hear is to obey, is a good saying. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Do you hear the Word of God? Do you take time to know the Word of God? If you never, if you never read the Word of God, if you never read your Bible, if you never hear God's voice in any way through reading the Bible, through listening to a video like this, through hearing a person who speaks by the Spirit of God, if you never hear God's voice, if you never hear God's word, you cannot have faith. I came to faith in 1977 when God spoke to me. 1 Samuel 3 verse 7 talks about the prophet Samuel, who said that he didn't know the Lord. The Lord was calling him, but he didn't know it was the Lord. And it says, Samuel did not yet know the Lord because the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Has the word of the Lord been revealed to you? If not, you cannot have faith. I would say pray for it. We're very late in time. You know, I don't, I don't know what God will do at this time. But don't be dismayed because God is going to apprehend even you later if you don't come in now. Don't fear. Don't give in to fear. Listen to what I'm saying. You do not have to be a believer in Jesus to understand what I'm saying today. I'm not trying to convert you. I'm not trying to um, even convince you to walk a certain way. The walk is practically finished now. And the overcomers have been chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. Most of the called were not chosen because they did not obey. I'm not saying this to scare you or to condemn you. I don't condemn you. Judge no one before the time. We will all be judged. Some of us judge ourselves because we judge ourselves by God's word now, and we will not go through further judgment later. Most people do not judge themselves now, and they will go through much judgment later. The tribulation is here. Do not be deceived. We are in the midst of tribulation. This is the time Jesus talked about in Matthew 24 that is worse than any time in history. And if Jesus did not come back now, no flesh would survive. No flesh could survive. Look what they're doing. And I'm not going to go through it. They throw my videos off when I tell about what they actually do that shows you what is really going on. We have no chance of survival now. All flesh will die unless Jesus comes back. But I have good news for you. He is coming back and he is coming to save your flesh and bring, it, bring you in as a spiritual being into his holy city. Even though you don't believe in him now, even though you never obeyed him, even though you said you believed in him, he's still going to do that for you. So in John chapter 18, when Judas came with the soldiers and uh, Jewish officials to arrest Jesus and betrayed Jesus to them by showing them where he was and pointing him out, Jesus said, let these men go. And Judas was one of those men. That's when John said that Jesus said this to the soldiers who fulfilled the word. He had previously spoken to them just in chapter 17. And he quotes, Of those whom you, his father, gave me, I have lost not one. So Jesus did not lose Judas Iscariot. That was John 18 verses 8 and 9. So that means that Judas is only a type of the son of perdition, the son of destruction. Because in chapter 17, he said he lost 
won. I only lost one. He said, well, who did he lose? He lost the son of perdition. The son of perdition, perdition is the carnal nature within you. It's within all of us. It's still in me. I still sin sometimes. I try not to ever sin. But you have to be perfect to not sin at all. And none of us are perfect yet. So Judas was a type of a figure, a parable, a story, a personal story telling you about this son of perdition, the son of destruction that lives in all of us. That's why life is so hard. We just mess up all the time. It's hard to get it right and live it right all the time, isn't it? So, understand, Judas himself will be saved. But the carnal man, the son of perdition that lives inside of us, can never be saved because he feeds from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil instead of the tree of life. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, as long as you decide what's right and wrong, you can never be saved. You can never make it because you are the truth then. What have you done? When you become the truth, what have you done? You've taken the place of Christ to define truth. You have become an antichrist. Now, isn't that something? Max Egan, Sasha Stone, uh, you uh, New Age prophets. Isn't that something? Mike Bickle and others who used prophecy to prop themselves up in the eyes of people so that they could be exalted and get what they want. Isn't that something? They became antichrist because they defined good and evil. They decided what they could do and whether it was right or wrong for them to do it without regard to what God said about it. Do you get it? Do you see that? Now, I just want to say one short thing to wind up this video today. I'm going to be making these shorter than I usually do. When you believe in Jesus, when you receive the earnest of the Holy Spirit by truly coming to faith, when you truly receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, when you truly believe in him and you repent of your sins, then you receive a new nature. You receive what the Bible calls the new man. That's a new nature that cannot sin, cannot live in sin. You will continue to sin, but if you have the new nature and you follow Christ in the obedience of faith, your spirit, your new man, will be fed by the Word of God. That's why you have to be born of water as well as the Spirit. The water is the Word of God. And you must feed your spirit with the Word of God, with the water, so that you will not continue to sin. So Christ's new nature in us cannot continue to sin. For it is the nature and life of God in us. That's what Emmanuel, God in us, God with us. That means that this mystery of iniquity, which is the son of perdition, which is what causes us to sin, has to grow along with our new nature, because we have to overcome sin. See, what is an overcomer? An overcomer is someone who overcomes sin, someone who conquers sin, someone who can be tempted with great temptation, lust, wealth, pride, 
and yet reject it. He can be tempted, but rejects the temptation and goes on with God and just doesn't do it. He doesn't, he does not choose the ways of the world, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life over the things of God. He overcomes those things. He overcomes. He overcomes by the word of God. The new man, if he is going to be an overcomer, must overcome all sin and death. He must conquer sin and death, just like Jesus did. 